Welcome to Stuck in My Mind podcast, the show where we dive into the mind of a regular guy on his road to self discovery. You'll hear everyday people just like you share the latest topics, personal stories, and things they've learned along the way. And now, please welcome your host, Wise. And welcome to another episode. I am your host, W-I-Z-E. I have a very special guest. He's a former Madison Ave ad man. Uh, he's an agency owner and a speaker. Welcome to the show, John Follis. Hey, John. Hey, Wise. What's up? Hey, what's going on? How you doing today, brother? I'm awesome. How about yourself? I am doing great, man. I am doing great. I'm I'm here to I'm able to do what I love doing, which is podcasting. I know what it's like. I started podcasting in early 06 and did it for seven years. Oh, so you was one of the OGs doing podcasting. Absolutely. And what was that? What was that experience for you like? It was great. I had a lot of fun until I just realized that it probably after seven years, I spent a lot of time editing my podcast. So, you know, I enjoyed the interview part, but then, you know, the three hours of editing, because I would take out, I would listen to myself and cringe every time. I heard myself say, um, um, um. So I took out 67 ums, you know, which takes a while to do. And after that, I said, you know, I, I'm too much of a perfectionist to continue doing this. So the great thing now with the advancements of advancement of technology, they call they have this, these certain apps now where you can actually upload your MP3 and they'll put it in, in words for you. And, um, you could take out the ums. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, an um remover. Yes. And it's yeah. just amazing. That's so funny because I was just talking about that with someone the other day and saying that it would be amazing if there was an app that removed the ums. Yes, there is. There's a couple of them. <laughs> but I had fun just like you. I, I Initially, I did it as a new business strategy to try to uh, interface with people that I hoped would... Um, have an opportunity to get to know me a little bit better and eventually hire me for my marketing consulting. And I just realized that um, that wasn't happening. So at that point, I just said the hell with it and just tried to find the most interesting people around the country that I could learn from. Uh, and at the time, because podcasting was such a the new shiny object, half the people I think weren't exactly even sure what it was. They just knew that it was an opportunity for them to talk about themselves and their, their business to a worldwide audience for free. And they said, yeah, count me in on that. So I was able to pretty much everyone I asked to be a guest uh, agreed. And I, I just, I, I mean, I asked for people that would be, you know, get thousand dollars or $2,000 to give a keynote speech somewhere to a corporate audience. And they were talking to me, you know, like we were buddies for 30 minutes for nothing, you know? So it was a great experience. I learned so much after seven years, just personally cherry picking people that I really felt had something that I wanted to learn, you know? And it's funny that you said, when you talk about something you wanted to learn, I, when I first, there was an episode where I was talking to a guest and I told them, I felt, I felt kind of selfish wanting to, interview certain people because I wanted to learn certain things and being able to speak to these people who are experts in those fields helped me grow and develop. But the person went, no, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. They said, that's self love. That's being actually selfless, selfless because you're actually sharing it with other people with sharing your podcast. And so it just kind of like, it just was like one of those moments where you're realizing you're growing with your podcast and you're learning so much from some of these speakers that it's like, and I wish everyone could do this. I wish everyone would want to try to experience this, but it's not for everyone. But like you said, there's a lot of hard work. Me being an independent podcaster, editing and spending a lot of time trying to make sure like you, I hear it. I listen to my podcast and I'm like, Oh man, I got to take that out. I got to take that out. And it's funny. Cause when I watch TV now, <laughs> and, or, and I watch a TV interview or something. You pick up on all, on all the little errors, all the little ums, all the little uh, and if you know, and there's a, so all the words that you're not supposed to say when you're interviewing people. Right. Well, I, I again, I'm I don't 
I don't know that much about you, but I'm going to take a guess that you are a PP. You know what that is? People person? Pod pandemic <laughs> podcaster. Yes, I am. <laughs> well, actually, I had wanted to start one prior to the pandemic. I had oh, yeah. Book. In 2019, in early 2019, I purchased a little podcast studio from Amazon for about 160 bucks. It came with a mic, a mixer, an adapter to plug the mixer into my laptop. For how much? 160 bucks. Interesting. Okay, that's a pretty good price. Was a mic any good? Yes, it was. It was a Behringer mic. It was the whole equipment was a Behringer mic. It came with headphones and everything. That's a pretty good package for that price point. And so I had the equipment laying that around and I kept messing with it. I would make excuses to why I wouldn't want to start because I, I was like, oh man, I sound horrible. Who's going to want to listen to me? Oh, what discussions am I going to be able to have? And then one day I just was, I was furloughed from work. Fast forward to 2020, I was furloughed from my job and the wife had a honey to-do list that was out the zoo and I was like, I need to find something to do. <laughs> what well, what what was your job? If I can ask, I'm, I'm a I'm a table games dealer. Table games, yes. Like ping pong, what? No, I, I deal blackjack, craps, ah uh, ah, uh, casino stuff. Yes. Table, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that ain't no ping pong, right? No, it's not. <laughs> Wow. Uh, and uh, have you gotten back into it or? Oh, yes. Yes. It's 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 my day job. This here is my my love and what I'm growing and building. So I, I get I'm able the hours that I work, I'm able to do this full time after as well. Well, I, I noticed you got 3000 plus subscribers, correct? Yes. That's impressive. Thank you. Um. So I know that sometimes those numbers can be deceiving. Yeah. Um, so um, if this show, we record the show in a month from now or two weeks from now, how many, how many people can you say would be listening to this? I'm averaging probably between 500 to 1500. That's good. And how are you doing that? See, and now I'm turning into the podcast host. Well, it's it's being it's consistency. It's it's just continuously putting out content. Just you can't expect people to you put out one video once a month, right? You have to be consistent, and the way people are consuming content nowadays, you just keep pushing it out. They keep right, I, and you're on a you're on a bunch of platforms, so people have multiple ways to find it, right? Yeah, yeah I'm on. Uh, I have over a thousand subscribers on. Uh, so followers on Instagram, over a thousand, about sixteen hundred on TikTok, which is growing daily. So, and, yeah. So, so for this, you slice and dice it to make it go on TikTok. Yeah. So you do yeah. that. You do that. You edit this so you get a tick, uh, a sixty second. I got. I have an app for that. <laughs> Are you kidding me? No, I'm not. So there's does an the app, app? There's, there's an app called head, called Headliners that once I up once I upload whatever. I can pick whatever segment, 10, 15 seconds of it, and it could create a wave format for me. Okay. And I'm able to release snippets. Do you use Canva? Yes, I do. I love Canva. Everything okay. you see, you see all the little background and all artwork in the back? That's all Canva. Okay. Like, yeah. Canva, I just, I just, um, at this point, I can do whatever I want to do. So I'm, spending most of my time playing tennis and guitar, learning new songs on my guitar. But um, if I was still in the game, I would be all over Canva. And yeah. I, you know, I just, I just, you know, I, it's been popping up on my screen on YouTube so much, I guess the, the uh, algorithm or the, uh, the uh, AI knows that I'm a potential Canva guy. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. it keeps popping up and they just said this. So I finally got on it because I'm not a TikTok guy, but I wanted to figure out how to get one of my existing videos, an existing desktop video onto TikTok. So I did it via Canva just to get it out of my system, just to do it. Right. Yeah. But it's, it's so user friendly. I just, I mean, I would be, I would, I would, I, I know that I could really get into Canva. Um, it, listen, Canva does everything it does. Uh, when I need a new, 
like the intro video, I use Canva. Every uh, a lot of the stuff that we put on our website, we use Canva. Uh, the book, we, my nephew's book, we published. We used to make the cover. We used Canva. Everything. Now you, you probably don't use the free version. I mean, you get all the bells and whistles. You got to pay for the. Yes, premium, I, I, I right? do. I do use the pro version. Yes. How much? How much is that? I paid yearly, so it saved. I save a few dollars by this. It's worth it, though, right? Because you're using a lot. It yeah. is so worth it. So, 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 right now we've been just shooting the shit. Is anyone going to be caring that we're talking about Canva? <laughs> <It's, it's, laughs> are you going to edit this out? No, no. Okay. This is why I enjoy it. This is why, if you really listen, we have I, I have conversations with people and we get to know each other this way. I want my people and my audience to know who you are. And yes, now we can start really getting serious and asking some questions. <laughs> well, one thing that one thing is pretty clear. I'm a very curious person. Oh no, I I love that. I love being able to to explain. I I love podcasting. So thank you. For being and I love I, I love and I like you. I love learning about people. So I I think I'm as interested to learn about you as you are maybe to you know learn about me because I you know I, and you know I think. As we were talking about earlier, I think for me, the pandemic has really made me feel isolated. So I've been I've been starving to talk to interesting people, you know? Yeah. All right. So now let's really get into the questions. Okay. All right. <laughs> all right. I'll, I'll try to shut up. Answer your questions anyway. All right. All right. So at the beginning of your career, right, you got fired four times in seven years. How, how did that happen? Uh, I suck at office politics. <laughs> I mean, to, to put it in a nutshell, I, you know, and I should, I shouldn't say that totally. I should give myself a little bit more credit for that because two of the four times I got fired uh, happened after the guy who hired me left the company. And, oh, so and somebody, yeah, that doesn't guarantee. No yeah. That doesn't necessarily guarantee a death sentence, but it doesn't help. I have to tell you. Oh no, definitely. They might, they want to bring in their own person. They want to bring somebody they know. And they yeah. feel comfortable with so yeah, it's understandable. So that 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 happened a couple of times, and um, I you know I um, I they don't teach you how to deal with office politics in college. You know they don't teach, they don't teach you a lot of stuff that deals with real life in college. <laughs> right, right, and you know some people just uh, naturally learn learn how to deal with that stuff, and I I, I was always kind of an irreverent kind of guy. So if I see bullshit going on, it's hard for me to like conform. You know, I, yeah, I, no, I feel you on that one. I definitely feel you on that. And it's it, you know, and it came out to be honest with you, it came out in different ways. I mean, one time I made a wisecrack at a big meeting, and I didn't, th I didn't think the boss would would hear me say what I said. And there was probably twenty five people in the in the in the room, and I made a wisecrack, and he heard it. And you know that that was basically a death sentence for that job. <laughs> Sometimes people can't take a joke. Well, <laughs> some people don't know when to keep their mouth shut, which was you know what it I was. You at that time? <laughs> yeah, it was me at that time, and you know I I was uh, I was to be honest with you, I was pretty naive when it came to that stuff, you know. But you know it uh, anyway. That it was listen when we were young, everybody was a little naive. Sure. All right, so who told you you would never make it in advertising and why? Yeah, uh, well, that's where it kind of started because not only did I get fired those four times in a, seven years, uh, prior to that, uh, when I was in an advertising program at Syracuse University, um, I had transferred to Syracuse, so I basically had to do a three-year program in two years. So... Um, not only did I have to, you know, go to summer school and, and take extra courses and, and, and not party um, at Syracuse because I was focused on my, my uh, trying to graduate on time. I had to do well in the courses I was taking. I couldn't, you know, in order to, to progress through the program and graduate, you had to get, I think, um, in your major, you had to get at least a, a B maybe. I don't remember what it was. So, the first advertising course, uh, and here's the thing, the guys, the people that they had teach advertising at Syracuse, 
they would they would get them to come up from New York City. A lot of these guys, not all of them, but many of them were uh, Madison Avenue guys that uh, God knows why would take the shuttle flight from uh, Kennedy or wherever to Syracuse for a few days and teach a few classes and then go back to New York. So the point is that the, we were being taught from the best people, uh, work, working professionals. So when they tell you something, you listen to them. You know, these these are the people that you aspire to be uh, at some point in your career. You know, mo not everyone, but most of the people at Syracuse um, would go to New York when they graduated. That was the idea. So we had a guy uh, from New York who was teaching an uh, advertising 101 class and um I started out in that class getting C's and my grades uh, con continued to go down from there as the course progressed. And I didn't understand why that was happening, because throughout my academic life uh, in high school and, and even the courses I took previous to that, I would always do exceptionally well. I would always get A's, straight A's in anything related to creativity or design. Or, And now I'm getting C's and D's. And um, I just realized that for whatever reason, I just uh, did not have a good relationship or a good connection with the instructor. I just kind of felt like for whatever reason, um, he, he, he just... He wasn't giving me a break or he didn't like my work. And I didn't think I was as bad as my grades were. And I eventually did something in the class toward the end of the class that ruffled his feathers um, and uh, prompted him to ask me to meet with him after class with about three weeks to go in the class. And he just looked at me and said very bluntly, uh, you don't really seem to get this, do you? And, you know, how do you respond to that? He's basically telling you, you don't get it. And he said, uh, listen, he said, I'm going to give you two options. Um, either you're going to um, drop the class right now with three weeks to go, or uh, you can try to survive the, the last three weeks of the class, but then you're going to have to take whatever grade I'm going to give you. And he, he said, I can't tell you what that grade is going to be, but I can tell you this, you're not going to like it, which is basically telling you he's going to flunk you. Uh, and like I said, you needed, I needed at least a B to, you know, to progress through the, to graduate on time. So pretty much um, it wasn't really an option. So uh, and then as I was walking out the door, I said, can I think about it? He said, yeah, I'll give you 24 hours. Let me know tomorrow what you want to do. And really wasn't much of an option because getting dropping the class and getting uh, no grade is better than getting an F. So um, as I was walking out the door, he said, listen, let me give you one last piece of advice, kid. Do not go into advertising. So that's that's a long answer to your question. So I ended up dropping the class and uh, my career in advertising, which turned out to be a pretty successful one, as we can get into later on, um, nearly ended before it even started. Because if I had really uh, taken his advice seriously, and I was really um, struggling with it, because like I said, this guy was a New York advertising guy, and I, I didn't take his comments lightly. When he tells you don't go into advertising, you, it's not something you can just shrug off. You really have to um, think about that. Um, and I, at that point, for a few weeks, uh, it was over Christmas break. I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I mean, I was more than halfway through college. And being basically told, don't don't go into the career you just decided you want to go into. So I, I didn't really have a plan B at that point. I didn't have like a second thing to pursue. So what I did was was um, I looked at the course catalog and I realized that they had other instructors teaching the same class. So I said, I don't know if I'm right about this or not, but I have a feeling that it may be possible that it has less to do with my talent and more to do with the fact that I'm not getting along with this guy. So let me try taking the same course with a different instructor. 
And if I do poorly in that class, then I'll then I'll give up advertising. And as it turned out, that was a good decision because I ended up getting an A minus in a class. So that was that was a lesson to be learned. Your, your show is about learning lessons. Yes, it is. That was that for me um, was a very important lesson for me to learn very early, even really before I got in my career is um, sometimes there's um, if you come up, if you if you run into an obstacle, it doesn't mean that you've got to totally back off. It just means you may have to stop, think about it and figure out another approach to getting beyond that obstacle. Yeah, <clears throat> you're absolutely right. I, I tell people when I speak to people, that's one of the things I do is you can never give up. Life throws obstacles in your way and you have to overcome them. I mean, sometimes you have to pivot. So it's not really giving up, but you, you kind of have to reevaluate. You can't yeah. keep banging your head. Like I said, yeah. I got fired four times. And instead of trying to get a job at another big agency, I just realized that maybe I just don't do well in the corporate environment. So, you, you know, at a certain point, you've got to reevaluate. And if something is not working, you can't just keep doing the same thing and ex expect a different result. Yep. So it's not necessarily, uh, you know, not giving up, but it's just trying a different approach. Absolutely. Definitely. So that led you to what led you to starting your own business? Well, it after getting fired that many times, I was um, at that point approaching 30. And um, I, uh, someone told, I started learning about something called freelance. Freelance was where you could get work from companies where you're not on staff. They have projects. Sometimes they bring you in for a couple of days or a couple of weeks as kind of a troubleshooter uh, to kind of solve a problem. I was a creative guy. So um, that, that, was a, that was a lot of agencies did that. So I thought that might be a way of making money and getting work that didn't subject me to the corporate politics because I wouldn't be there long enough for someone to like want to get rid of me. <laughs> so, True. So, so it was out of uh, and, and once I started doing that, um, not only was I making money, but um, I was able to um, in a, in one instance, I was able to uh, work on an ad campaign that was really getting a lot of attention in New York. Um, it was creating what's called a buzz where people were talking about it. They wanted to know who was doing this work. And it's just me and a couple of other guys. We were all freelancers. And um, that is what attracted a guy who called me out of the blue, who was a, a, um, a business guy, a new business guy who was actually looking for a talented creative guy because he felt he didn't like the corporate environment also. And he thought that if he could find a really top notch creative guy, the two of us could pitch business on our own and try, try to start something. So it was out of freelancing for a couple of years that I attracted uh, this guy who called me out of the blue. I had no idea who he was, but he was referred to me. And, um, we went out for a beer. I never forget. We went out for a beer in the city and he, you know, he, he looked at my work. I had a portfolio of work and I had nothing to, to judge him by other than his suit. And, um, 20 minutes after, after talking and after he looked at my work, he said, why don't we start an agency together? To which, you know, part of me was flattered, but another part of me was like going on a date with someone and saying them saying, let's get married. You know, <laughs> you know, after 20 minutes, you say, Let, let's let's get to know each other a little bit first, you know. But eventually um, he was very, very good. He was a really aggressive uh, sales guy. So he was able to get meetings like crazy. And uh, once we got a meeting and had an opportunity to do the work, I was really good at the creative uh, stuff. So within a very short period of time, we not only had an agency, but we we had an agency that was growing quickly and winning a lot of creative awards. And uh, after after three and a half years of working together, we were one of the top award winning ad agencies, not just in New York, but in the entire country. So it was pretty crazy, especially after getting fired all those times and told <laughs> you suck at advertising, you know. <laughs> 
<clears throat> no, but it, I understand and feel because here I have I have my partner and my, and my other I have my two partners, uh, my nephew Brand and um, Bobby J and my good friend Brandy J, and there's things that I'm not good at that they're good at. So, just like you was the creative guy, he was the the, the sell, he was the ad, he was the guy going out there selling the the product selling the ad like, this yeah is the what sales, we got. sales guy new business yeah and so sometimes what you, that's what you need someone who's maybe you, you might not have been that that sales guy right but you needed that person to help you as well and that helped each other he wasn't the creative guy Absol- was. absolutely so it, it shows it goes to show you sometimes I mean, you. Yeah, look at look at Apple computer, right? It wasn't yeah. just everyone knows Steve Jobs, not not everyone knows Steve Wozniak. Yeah. You you probably know Steve Wozniak. Yes. But most people don't know that name and Steve Jobs was the outside Steve Jobs was the outside guy and Wozniak was the geek who really actually built the first Apple computer. And then Steve was the guy that figured out how to sell it and market it. So to your point and to the point of this conversation, that's absolutely true. Not in every case, but certainly in many, yeah. many cases. No, and but if you see, if you notice this, always in successful duos like that, it's one that hey, this is the guy that handles this, and this is the guy that does that. And and in any, in any business, like I have, I have, like I said, I have a great team. Like me and me and my nephew, we aren't the best marketing branding guys, but Brandy knows all that she she's always promoting on all types of apps she's everywhere promoting and so she takes care of that part me i'm the audio video guy i know all the little tech because i'm the one who's, who's studying all these tech gadgets yeah. and so I, I i go get the the equipment that we need and all that and then my nephew he's just um he's just very he's very structured he's he's the structured guy he's the guy who's like all right we need this done this done this done he's very organized so that's, so, so that's another valuable lesson i think for your listeners to uh if they don't already know that to be reminded of that and the challenge of course is finding someone that is that other person because that's some people are, are looking for that person uh, all their lives and never, you know, like, like a marriage partner, it's not necessarily an easy thing to find. Right. No. And in my case, I have to tell you, when I met this guy, um, there was no, there was no doubt in my mind that he was an aggressive sales guy. I just didn't know um, if I liked him. <laughs> uh, Cause there were things about him that uh, I just felt, um, wouldn't would not make us compatible over the long term and it turned out to be true uh i i kind of felt like this is going to be um an interesting experience for a while but probably not long term and eventually um after about four years um i just realized it was time to leave but i you know i learned a lot and it was a great experience working with someone you know because of that relationship it was really as a result of that relationship that I achieved much of the success of my career. Like I said, we were a top award-winning agency. We had some amazing experiences. I got, it was through that partnership that uh, we did some work for child abuse prevention that uh, got the attention. Uh, actually the NBA was running that we, we did a TV campaign wise that uh, ran during the NBA playoff games so the commercials we did or that I created uh, ran like crazy for about six weeks during the playoffs. And uh, about a month or two after that happened, I got an invitation in the mail from the White House that I thought was a joke. I mean, who gets an invitation from the White House, right? And I, I, Yeah, I, I know. I know I would be I would think it was a joke if I saw an <laughs> invitation from the White House. And I opened it up and it was like this fancy script embossed gold lettering on this 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 card. And it was from the first lady saying, uh, we would like to invite you to a White House reception honoring people who've done great public service work. You know, we hope you can make it. And uh, so I still to this day don't know exactly 
how my TV campaign got on the radar of the White House. It might have even been the president who was watching basketball and, you know, mentioned to the first lady. I don't really know how that works. All I know is that uh, about a month after that the campaign ran, I got the invitation and my partner and I were were one of a couple of dozen people. They were inviting people from around the U.S. who were doing various uh, public service projects that the White House felt deserved to be acknowledged. So um, that, you know, that was one of the highlights of, of my career. And that was, again, another thing that happened as a result of that partnership, because he was very good at selling my stuff and I was good at the creative side. Yeah. Oh, man, that's that's crazy. You was also invited to the U.N. And and yes, um, and the U.N. thing, um, again, was another it was another uh, public service ad that I, I came up with. And my partner was able to sell to a uh, chapter of uh, child abuse prevention uh, based in Albany, New York. Um, and they ran the ad uh, different. This was a print ad. So they ran it in the newspaper. And because the ad ran, we could enter it in the award advertising award shows. And that year was the first year that the United Nations had something called the United Nations Public Service Award. I had never heard of it, but uh, we entered it in various award shows. And someone at the U.N., I guess, was looking at the award-winning work from these advertising shows and decided that because my ad had kind of an international, it was child abuse, but it had kind of an international message to it that they decided that it deserved a pu United Nations Public Service Award. So about six months after being invited to the White House, I get another thing in the mail, this time from the United Nations, saying, congratulations, you are one of the recipients from our first ever United Nations Public Service Award. Uh, please come to United Nations on this day to receive your award. So later that year, I hopped on my bicycle and rode over to the United Nations and got my United Nations Award. You took your bicycle to the United Nations Award? I got around, I got around Manhattan on a bike, yeah. <laughs> So it was a, that was a, that was a good year. Yeah. Oh, listen, everybody, it, as everybody, I can't lie, because me in the city, it's either public transportation or I rode my bike somewhere. It wasn't. Yeah. I was, there's no. I didn't have a car. So. Yeah, you, you, I was in Manhattan. You do not want to have a car in Manhattan. No, there's no parking. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I loved, I loved. You know, once you get over the fear of getting killed, <laughs> it's really, uh, and you know, I got knocked off a few times. I got hit by a couple of cabs. Fortunately, it didn't break anything. It's always the cabs, isn't it? It's yeah. It's called getting doored where you never know who's going to jump out of a cab. And sometimes you can't go wide enough on your bike. And someone just jumps out of a cab without looking. And you know, you're going to, you're going to lose that, that battle. Oh man. Yeah. All the time. But yeah, so anyway, it was uh, it was quite quite an experience. And uh, then after about four years of working with this guy, um, I just realized that it was time to go on my own and um, spent the next uh, 20 years, basically. Well, initially, I had a couple of employees when I split off. I had a couple of people working with me. I was still um, operating as an advertising agency. And then as the media landscape changed and it became harder and harder to find clients and businesses that wanted to do advertising because all of a sudden this thing called the Internet was getting people's attentions and everyone was asking less about advertising than they were about websites and blogs and e-newsletters and things like that. So I realized I had to, um, I had to change my business model. And I started doing online consulting. This was pre-Zoom, so back then it was Skype. But I set up a consulting model uh, where I was consulting just like this with business owners around the country in 2004 and did that for about 15 years. And when you did that, you were, you were helping them set, what uh, market their business? Yeah, yeah, because a lot of them, they, they knew they didn't, 
want advertising because to them advertising was TV, radio, print, and that kind of stuff. But they needed to some, you know, marketing. They may maybe they needed a brochure, maybe they needed a better logo, or they said, "What is? How do I brand myself? How, do I need a new tagline? What do you think of my website?" Uh, should I do a blog? These were the questions they were asking me. And then, you know, when, when podcasting came around, that was another thing. So the media landscape, uh, you know, once once the Internet came around, just like the way it is now, every every couple of years there, it would it, there would be a shift where there'd be a new way to engage people. So these the, these people that I was talking to at networking events, their heads were spinning about what to do, you know, do I need digital video on my web? I have a website, but what about video? That's when video was a new thing. So they, they had so many questions and I wanted to be in a position to give them answers. And so what started out as consulting, just maybe an hour or two consulting, uh, made, made it more obvious to, to both of us, me and the person I was talking to, exactly what they needed out of a conversation would come a project to do maybe uh, a series of digital videos. So I would kind of talk my way into a project, a dedicated project that then I could, I could bill as a project. Cause you could only, you know, I didn't like the model of an hourly rate. I thought that was not a good long-term way to build a business, but it was a way for me to begin a conversation and get paid for the conversation out of which could come a specific project that I could then bill for that project. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so that was, that turned out to be, you know, the challenge was just getting on the radar of different people. So I can have that introductory conversation. And then, cause every time I started the conversation, it would become pretty, pretty quickly. It'd become pretty clear what they needed to do, you know? Okay. And it was fun. I loved, you know, it was like this. I love, this is why I was asking you questions because I love talking to other entrepreneurial people who have a product or service. You know, they're passionate about it. I love helping people. I know what it's like being an entrepreneur because I was an entrepreneur for, you know, 27 out of my 30, 35 years in business. So I know what it's like having my own business. And I just, I'm really good at, at, at marketing and advertising. And I love, I love coming up with creative solutions to helping uh, business owners. So, Anyway, that's what I was doing. <laughs> and then I started a digital, then because digital video became such a thing, I wanted to have a dedicated business model specifically for video because when you say you're a marketing guy, that can mean anything. It's kind of a very blurry kind of a uh, description of what, what you do when you say you're a marketing guy because there's so many flavors of marketing. But when you say you create exciting digital content that gets that engages your your prospect, that gets them excited about your 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 business, they want to they want to know more about that because they understand what digital video is. And I was really good at creating digital video content. So in 2013, I said I, I'm not going to stop doing this marketing and consulting, but I want to have a dedicated platform specifically that that show, showcases my digital video work and that was called big idea video and i had that in 2013 because i love creating digital video content oh i just started doing uh the visit the video aspect of my podcast last september prior to that i had recorded all my episodes simply using just the audio aspect of it and i had a couple that they were uh, marketing specialists and they're like, do you do video? I'm like, no, not yet. And they went, do you do video? I'm like, no, not yet. And they go, do you do video? I said, yes, I do video now. Because <laughs> I understood what they were talking about because it was another form of me branding yeah. and marketing because I should have been you started video. I was just laziness on my part. Not I have to say, if you're doing a podcast, video is less important because they don't need to see my pretty face or your no, pretty face yes, but there you was know, other aspects it was it, it was it was in a way of it was form of using it as content just another form of content but i would I'm say I, I would say for 95 percent of businesses out there uh they have a product or service that um needs to get 
uh, on the radar screen. They need to get their prospects excited about their business or service. Yeah. And especially if they're in the business to business uh, area, oftentimes they need to explain what their product or service is and how it how it helps because it's not like you're selling Coke or McDonald's. Everyone knows what Coke and McDonald's it's a is. brand name. Yeah. But if you're selling some kind of a widget or something or some kind of technical device that, you know, does something, you need to have a series of videos that that makes it easier for your prospect to be excited about about what that product or service does. And that's why everyone, no matter what your business is, really needs to have some not just video, but really excellent compelling video content that gets people excited. And that's, that was my forte doing the creative work. Cause you know, at a certain point people had a lot of video, but it wasn't very good video, you know? Yeah. All right. Yeah. I get it. That's... So uh, now, now, now what are you doing now? Are you still in the ad ad business or are you retired? Well, now, or... now I, um, <clears throat> I, um, when I started getting into video content creation, the way my mind works, um, I started uh, thinking about the possibility of creating something on my own, like um, that, <clears throat> that I thought people would be interested in watching, something longer format, something that didn't just sell someone else's product or service, something that was more like a story or a message. Um, I started something called... Um, in 2015, because I had so many crazy stories about my career on Madison Avenue and I had written, um, started writing them down um, years and years ago. I nearly got published, by the way. I, I, I came as close as getting a, um, a literary, literary agent in the mid-90s, um, uh, which is pretty, pretty much half the battle of getting published when you have a top literary agent who says, I think this, this could be a book. That's about you have about a 50 50 chance of you know getting a publishing deal. So I, I was on the other side of that 50 50, did not get a, a business a publishing deal, but I had these these stories that I'd written. So when I got into <clears throat> video content creation, I decided to take some of these stories about my advertising experiences and convert them into longer format video stories, like mini documentaries all from my desktop because you could do a lot of stuff from your desktop. Yeah, you can. And I really enjoyed the process of storytelling using animation and things like that, you know, and good audio. And again, just using the software that's, that that's available to anyone at their desktop. And I, I liked it so much. I decided to come up with something, uh, a bigger theme that I thought would be, um, more cult culturally relevant than my personal advertising stories and um, created a 47 minute documentary um, that took about six months to create and um, put it up on YouTube and Vimeo. And it's now been seen by 40,000 people from 98 countries. Wow. And it, it won this thing, which for your video people, it's a Hollywood, Hollywood International Independent Docu Documentary Award in 2017. 2017. And again, that, that blew my mind because I just created this thing for my desktop. And uh, I thought it was, I thought it was pretty good, but I didn't think it was worthy of winning a Holly, Hollywood uh, International Film Festival Award. Um, so that was quite a validation for it. And the fact, I, I guess the best validation was the fact that 40,000 people from 98 countries have actually watched this thing. Um, and I mean, that's a whole nother story. It's about, um, it's about people who are um, deciding they no longer, they're, they're, they're transitioning away from traditional religion because a lot of what they, um, a lot of what has gone on with a lot of ministers and stuff like that, you with child abuse and um, a lot of ministers behaving badly and stuff like that, and just um, a lot of you know, just a lot of the stuff that has turned a lot of people off from from the organized, idea, yeah. 
organized religion. Re yeah. Organized religion. And I was one of those people. So it 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 was very personal uh to me. So I decided, oh, and so this is what was a tipping point. I found out I did some research and I found out that it wasn't just normal people who were leaving religion, but more and more ministers and priests and pastors were coming to the conclusion that they no longer believed in the product that they had been preaching about for five, 10, 15, 20, 30 years. And they were trying to figure out how to leave their career as a minister or a pastor because they no longer believed in it anymore. And so that I thought was an interesting subject for a documentary. That's no, that is really interesting. I didn't, I didn't know that as a really, it's crazy because I am not a religious person. I consider myself more of a spiritual person where I do believe in a higher power or whatever. But to me, I just felt, organized religion to me was some way of, it was just a way of being controlled and yeah i just, i prefer to to believe in 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 what i believe in um I, I to me i listen basically i live my life learning growing wanting to develop as a person and to me i just didn't feel religion was the key I, I'm a spiritual person. I believe in, in a high, like I said, I believe in a higher being. I'm, I wake up every morning thanking spirit for, for providing me with everything I have. And so that's how I practice my, right. My, so, my aspect. So, you know, I, I had this idea kind of swimming around my head and I didn't really think it was worthy of a documentary until I, I stumbled on the fact that, a lot of these more and more ministers, priests and ministers were um, trying to bail from their religious professions. And I thought um, that I thought could make a really interesting focus, uh, at least for part part of this documentary. Um, and so I I, um, I thought it was worth giving it a shot because I made a few of these other uh, longer, these documentary style videos about my advertising career and they came out pretty well. And um, so to answer your question, I, um, I gave myself permission around 2015, 2017 to um, take a step back from chasing after new, new clients and trying to make money and just allow myself the, the freedom to totally focus. Because I, I knew if I was going to make anything good, I needed to kind of clear my decks and allow myself to clear my mind and my uh, to, to totally put all my energy in, into doing this. And even then, I didn't know that I could make anything that was would be worth watching. But I, I, uh, after doing that, I just realized that financially, I don't have kids, so I don't have a, a family to support, which makes it easier. And I no longer live in New York. I live in Connecticut. So, so the, the overhead is a little bit lower here than it was in New York. So all things considered... Um, I just, I, I mean, I'm 68 years old also. So, you know, I'm not, you know, I've, uh, um, I've kind of paid my dues and I'm at the point now where the more, the most important thing for me is time. Yeah. That's, you know, my, my, my time is running out quicker than my money. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I want to make the most, you know, it's not that I don't need money, but, you know, fortunately, um, I've uh, I do, I've done well in my career. I've invested wisely in my career. I've been lucky so far. I mean, there's no guarantee of what the future will be, but um, I just decided um, about six or seven years ago that I better start focusing on the things that really give me joy because there's no guarantee at this age then I'm going to be around, um, you know, next year, never mind next week. <laughs> you know, I mean, at this age, I've got friends of mine that are, you know, uh, you know, having some pretty serious health problems. And, you know, fortunately, I'm, I'm, I'm in good shape right now. But uh, life, life it, at this point, you realize how, how short life really is. And I just I want to do things that I really this is one reason I do this stuff with with you, because I love if I have any wisdom to share or any, any um, lessons to be learned or any um, thing from my personal experience to share with other people that might be benefit other people, I'm happy to do that. 
and I also do volunteer work. I try to, you know, use my time. So I'm just not watching, you know, uh, Netflix all day um, where I can kind of give back and, and, and uh, find opportunities to volunteer and help other people. I love doing that. Uh, and that's what you're supposed to do. And that's, it's great. It's, it's you, you're enjoying life. That's what you're doing. You're, you're enjoying, you, you've come to the conclusion, like, listen, I've worked hard enough. It's time for me to really enjoy and do what I want to do. Like you said, you're taking, you're doing, playing the guitar. Right. You're, you're wanting to grow and develop. And st- right. listen, you're never too old to still grow and learn and, 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 right. and, and have, and have fun and enjoy life. Yeah. And it just, it, you know, it relieves some pressure when you feel like, I mean, I was hustling, you know, from the time I was 15 years old, um, mowing lawns and trying to start a business, you know, when I was 15, you know, to just a few years ago. And, and again, not everyone gets to this point. Um, I think if I had a family, if I had kids to put through college, um, or if I was living in a more expensive city, I would not be in this situation. So, you know, not, not a lot of people never get to this point in their life. And, uh, you know, I've fortunate the way my life has gone that I'm at this point and, uh, I can, I can afford to do the things that, um, I really enjoy. That's good. That's good. Well, this is John, this has been great. I, I, I love having you on. This has been, um, wow. We've been on here 51 minutes, man. This is, I love this. This just goes to show you. Usually I, I usually average 35, 40 minutes, but when you have a great conversation with somebody, that's why when you're like, are we going to, when are we going to start talking? That's why I start, I just have a conversation. I want people to at least get to know my guests. I don't want them to think that they're just coming on to be, no, I want them to see that you're a real person, that you're someone just like them. It's an average guy that, Hey, you did some great things. You made, you built a successful business, but you had your struggles. You got fired four times in the first seven years. Right. And so and told, and told and told by my first advertising instructor that I should not pursue advertising as a career. So, yeah. And, but you didn't let that stop you. And so that's why I love doing my podcast is because I'm able to provide, if, like you said, if you can, if someone can learn one thing from whatever you said, or if you can help one person, that's why I do my podcast. So if my, my guests or I share anything that someone needs to hear at that point, and if it's just one person, I, I'm happy with that. I'm, I'm, I'm ecstatic because I'm doing what I'm doing. I love to do, which is help people, help people grow. Let, let them realize that, yes, we all go through struggles. We all have our, our good times and we have our bad times, but that's life. You just have to continue going. Right. Right. And you know, if you can make money doing what you love doing, that's even better. Even right? better. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. If you can become be successful and, and build something from it, that's even greater. Well, hopefully it'll be interviews like this. That'll help you to do that. Right. Oh yes, I love interviews like this. I have, I have another interview this uh, week. Um, it's a, it's, I'm excited to have him on as a guest because I'm a fan of his work. I, I'm, I'm a big self development guy, and, and I'm always reading something that I, love, I like to read. And so to have them on my podcast is, I'm excited. Right. So it, it's these, is these, is these guests that I have on that have helped build me up because I've had some great guests on. I've had some great people to have come on. Like this one was a great conversation and these are the conversations I enjoy the most. And then it comes down to marketing, right? You could have, you could have the great content, but if you can't figure out how to market it, so people find it, it doesn't mean much, right? You have to use the tools that are, that are out there. Like yeah. you were surprised. Like I said, I, I make snippets of everything. I use headliner. I, I use Canva. I use Instagram, TikTok. I, I use the tools that are out there for me to use. And some people, I'm not a marketing guy, but I'm always taking a course where I'm learning about what successful YouTubers do or successful right. podcasters do. And those are things that they recommend. So who am I not, who am I to, to bump the system? Like, there's people there that these are people who are successful at doing it, know what they're talking about. Why would I want to switch it up? Like, 
Right. That makes no sense to me. Right. But now uh, is the time. Well, now is the time where you get to plug away, let everybody know where they can find you, your website, everything. Yeah. Well, I may be the only guest you've ever had on your show that doesn't have anything to plug. Uh, <laughs> because of the reasons I mentioned earlier, that's not why I'm doing this. I'm doing this because I just enjoy having conversations with people like you and hopefully saying something that might be of interest to your, to your audience. Um, but I do have a lot of content online. Um, if anyone is intrigued with this conversation and wants to know more about any of the things that were discussed here, they could plug my name into <clears throat> Google or YouTube. Uh, the film that I referred to earlier is called leaving God so if you plug, if you type in leaving God and my name, which is John Follis, F-O-L-L-I-S, for yo, those uh, listening to this, um, it will come up. And I've got, I've got three YouTube channels, I think. So, you know, you plug me into YouTube, my name, uh, it'll, it'll come up. My channel's Big Idea Video, so that will come up in YouTube. So anyway... That, that's not really plugging anything, but that'll just give people an opportunity to uh, check out. Listen, yeah, it gives, it gives them the opportunity to go check out your work. Maybe someone yeah. who listening to the show might be like, hey, I like his style. Let me see what he what he has out there. So yeah, that's what I mean by plug. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have anything. Book or anything. So it's just you might have content that people might enjoy, that it might be beneficial to them. So. And my, yes. my website, I do still have a website, so there's a lot of stuff on the website. That is Follis Inc., F-O-L-L-I-S-I-N-C.com. So that's that's still the uh, the architecture <laughs> from 1996 when it went up. I just too, no, didn't really have a need to give it a facelift because, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't need to do that anymore. But there's yeah. probably, a, I, I think it's up to like 800 pages now of, of stuff. But uh, it's pretty easy to navigate. So if if you're, you know, a lot of the things I I, I mentioned um, can be found by going to that website. All right. So thank you very much, John. Don't thank you for being a guest, but don't leave just yet. We're going to try a little bit off the air. Okay. Okay. All right. So now it is time for shout outs. Big shout out to my partners, Brandy J, Poppy J. Love you guys. Big shout out to the boss lady, Fina. Love you, baby, and appreciate you. Big shout out to our, our to our guest John Follis for coming through and sharing his his expertise and his story. And as always, a big big shout out to all the essential workers out there. God bless y'all. Be safe. And you know your boy Wise does it. Peace out. Thanks for listening. Listen on iTunes, Podbean, Spotify, and TuneIn. Find us on social media on Twitter at wise underscore B underscore blunt, Instagram at wise underscore B underscore blunt, and a Facebook fan page, www.facebook slash wise76. Check back soon for new episodes. Until next time, peace out. Peace out.